This is the unique experience for people who've been wrongly convicted. But still, I mean, it's fascinating. The guy on the left side of me, he's in prison for killing someone. The guy behind me raped and killed two people. The guy on this side robbed and killed someone. Society sees the demon on TV. I saw the demon up close. But I also witnessed the human element right alongside the demon. I saw the man struggling to come to terms with his crime. This is Jorge Rivera with First Coast.TV. I find myself here with Lara North Norton, and I find myself here with Gregory Bright. Uh, Gregory Bright um, had a powerful story, which um, Lara was instrumental in finding the words for him to, to tell this story with great timing and great impact. And the people in the audience, I mean, there were times I was wiping tears off my eyes because it was a powerful story. It was true and was heartfelt, especially when you talked about your mom and the girlfriend that kept visiting you so much. So my question uh, to you, Lara, to start is, how did the universe and its forces bring you together? I met Greg Bright about eight years ago. We were both working on a, a separate project through the Innocence Project New Orleans. And I was there working with four exonerees, helping them just craft 10-minute presentations about their wrongful convictions. And three of the guys were from death row, and Greg was, um, was, had a life sentence. And after we completed that project, I was, I was still curious about Greg's experience. And I think one of the things that drew me so much to him was the way he was able to talk about forgiveness. And Greg's a great storyteller. He can, he can weave a great tale. So, you know, as a writer, that's appealing to me as well. So we weren't entirely sure what this would become, but we decided to work together and to let it, let it evolve. And um, ended up interviewing Greg for the next couple of years mm. as we crafted this one-man stage play. Now, Gregory, you've told this story many times now. What's the impact that you have when you tell this story again? And, and what's the vibration you feel from the people who sit and listen to you tell this story? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm highly impacted when I hear people say things like, you know, they've, they've, they've been touched in a way that they have never been touched. Um, it, um, it's heart, heartfelt and it's, um, it's things like that that's, that's motivate me, but especially when I get the chance and opportunity to share this experience with young people. And I hear young people say and ask questions that um, I know in their heart they're considering uh, my words. So that's, it's, it's, it's a very powerful thing for me. And it's, it has become part of my motivation because in somewhere in someone in the audience is going to say something to that effect that, you know, keep doing what you're doing. Or, or, you know, I'm, I'm proud to be here, or thank you for coming, and thank you for sharing. It's just a, a, a truly wonderful and humbling experience. I haven't seen four letters. One I was very, very curious about, because it was from my girl, Claudette. I kept looking at the letter, but I had a blockage in my mind, because I didn't know how to read. The blockage hovered over my consciousness like a mirror. I pick up a letter, a mirror image of, man, you can't read. You can't read. I didn't want whatever Claudette was telling me to come off someone else's lips. But I had to find out what was in this letter. Now, Pop was an older guy. He kept a Bible in his hand. So I said, Look, Pop, 
I'll give you some cigarettes. And when I get mail, you read to me what's going on. But to my surprise, I mean, it really floored me. Pop couldn't read. To see a group of people caught in a situation like that with no help, it's really sad. Because the illiteracy rate in prison was almost complete. My last question to you is, what I love about it is at the end, it's the forgiveness part that really hits people. 27 and a half years in prison, watching this injustice stand year after year, you're convinced somehow deep in your soul, I'm not going to die in this place. And you come with forgiveness. What's the forgiveness thing about? Well, the forgiveness, you know, like I say in the play, you know, it, 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 forgiveness didn't come just, a rock just didn't fall out of the sky and hit me in the head and say, look, be forgiven and you'll get out. I mean, it, it, it was a process and it began when, after my mom passed. When my mom passed, I had to really rethink and reevaluate, and take self-inventory, and you know, figure out how would I survive, uh, especially in a situation that would, like that, without you know her guidance and uh, her um, insight and stuff like that. And so, um, you know, I just fell to a place where. Um, you know, I was surrounded by people that I had been living around for the past 20 something years, but when she passed, they all seemed like strangers. And so, you know, I was stuck in a situation where I had to really just, you know, consider all my options. And one of the things that had been weighing me down that I was really, really conscious of was the fact that I was, uh, you know, I was holding a lot of hatred and, you know, animosity and stuff like that you know, toward the people that was um, responsible for, you know, my imprisonment and somehow uh, not, uh, you know, my family for not, you know, having influence or money. You know, it was just, and, you know, all that was just selfishness, you know. And I had to take self inventory about that, let that go. And uh, when I reached this new place of forgiveness, then, you know, things began to happen. And so, that's how, that's how it came to be. Well, I'll say my last words is uh, I think I feel like everyone else felt in this place. You're both two extraordinary human beings. We'll have a message that is universal and just so powerful. And I thank you both. Thank you. It was amazing. All right.